Hello there, sword friends. This is going to be a review on an Albion Svante. Hopefully I'm saying that right. The next thing I need to mention to you is the biases and general caveats that go to this review before you hear anything else I have to say. The first one is that, well, basically this is a secondhand sword. It's a secondhand sword and so it may not be representative of what you would get from Albion today. But I think it is. Uh, it was purchased from Albion, then bought by I think a few different people and I know it has been sent back to Albion to be refurbished or touched up if you will that's a service that they offer on a myriad of their products well they pretty much sell swords but on their swords you can send it back to them and they will clean up what ails them for a certain fee I know that was done with this sword and frankly it's my understanding that this sword has traveled back and forth to Australia a few times which means it may have seen more of the world than I have so anyway it is secondhand though and I have to give it the caveat that the handling bits, the, the small bits of patina or rust you might see on the sword, uh, or maybe even how well it cuts the factory edge may not be 100% representative of what you would buy from Albion today. The second thing I need to note is that I bought the sword with my own money. It's not a review sample. I'm not affiliated with Albion either in any particular type of way other than being a fan. I've had their swords in the past, and I've come to expect high things or high praise or high... Uh, my, my expectations, needless to say, are quite lofty. I, I think of them as kind of the standard by which other medieval arms are judged. Not to say I can't be objective, I think I can, but know that in general my opinion of their stuff is pretty good. So now you have all of the, the things that could make me a shitbag or make my opinion invalid in your mind, and hopefully that steers whether you want to listen to me or not. So let's get on with the tidbits of the review and such. I think the real elephant in the room that needs to be addressed, kind of first and foremost, is looking at this sword, it's from their museum line of products, and that means that it's supposed to be a relatively accurate representation of a piece found in a museum, a found blade. It's not supposed to be an artistic interpretation or some liberty taken or a modern design of what might have existed in the past. It's supposed to be a recreation with modern tools and modern steel as an exception of a historic piece in a museum. And that takes research and it takes effort and there's a lot of stuff that goes along with it and what goes along with it is also a fucking $4,000 price tag. Now, as I look at that, I think that's really the elephant in the room. If I compare it to other Albion swords, say the Earl, uh, that's another Type 18B sword. And the Type 18B swords, it has an S-guard, it has a hollow ground blade, and it has a pommel that is similar, but it's not an exact recreation, but it comes in at under half the cost, and, you know, still under half the cost if you want to get a wire grip on it. Now, there are some differences in the blade, the Ricasso, I'm sure there's some size differences, some dynamic differences as well, but the thing I have to keep at the back of my mind is that this is, one, supposed to be a recreation of a historic piece from a museum, and I'm not a student of history, so this is something that's maybe a little bit lost on me. I am guessing that the person that would find the most interest in this sword, the person that would want to spend $4,000 or twice a similar blade from Albion, uh, which is, is not quite apples to apples, but about as apples to apples as we're going to get, I think that person is going to really relish in the historical features of this blade. And I'm not a great student of history. I'm not a student of historic European martial arts. I'm probably the worst person to review this blade. But... I have the song, bitch, so I'm doing it anyway. The point is, I do have to keep in context that this is supposed to be a historic blade, and I think most of what we're going to find, or what I'm going to tell you about, is really that you have to love that piece of it to justify the cost. I'm going to compare his, the historic version of the sword to the sword itself, and I'm going to give you my general thoughts on how well it's constructed. And personally, I separate these two features. One is this is supposed to be a recreation of a historic piece, and I have to put into my mind that that is something a person that buys this would want. So I'm gonna show photos from the original blade that I was able to find, and I'm gonna show photos that I took of this Albion sword. And we're gonna compare the two, and also I'm gonna do almost a, a separate section on just how this sword is constructed in my personal opinion. And I'll show some photos so that you can pretty much watch this whole review on mute and not listen to anything I have to say, which frankly, may be advantageous to learning. Now, one thing I do have to note about the cost of this particular blade 
is the difficulty in making it. Some time ago, I went to a game hole con or some sort of convention where Albion was, had a booth at the event, and I got a chance to handle and feel a lot of different Albion swords, and I got a chance to talk to Mike at Albion. Now, uh, I asked one question in there, and I wish I had the foresight to get it on camera, but the question was, what's the hardest sword to make? And, you know, without a lot of hesitation, Mike said that the Svante is one of the hardest swords to make. There's a lot of angles and hollow ground things, and, and frankly, even though it might look simplistic, it's uh, one of the, the more difficult swords to make with, in terms of the geometry and all sorts of other things Mike said that, frankly, I wasn't paying attention to because he had a table full of swords and it was so pretty and I was excited to touch them. The, the point is, though, that um, I know it's, or I've heard, that it's one of the more difficult swords to make. And if it's more difficult, it's more laborious, that labor costs money, and money is what's reflected in this $4,000 price tag. Now, I don't necessarily know what the difference between the Earl and the Sante is in terms of the laborious nature of them. They seem to have relatively similar features, but maybe there's something I'm completely missing that, uh, that changes the dynamic of how laborious it is to create. Though I have to imagine I'd rather dual wheel two Earls, not in an actual pragmatic practical sense, but for shits and giggles in terms of looking cool, I'd rather have two of those than one Sante. I'll get to that, though, in a moment. Now, the first part of this review, I think it would be best for me to just examine the sword in terms of its manufacturing construction quality, rather than looking at it as a historic art object or recreation. I'm just going to examine the sword on its own merits, disregarding any of that, and I'll move to the historic comparison later. So let's start at the bottom, the peen block. Now, I think the peen block is actually pretty well executed. Is it some artful, really hand engraved, elaborate thing? No, but does it look pretty? Is it completely functional? Is it nice? Absolutely. I do have to admit that I like the look of the peen block. It looks like it has some extra detail. Whether or not this is what you would expect in a $4,000 blade, uh, that remains to be seen, but I do admit that it looks, it looks pretty nice. The pommel itself and the faceting on the blade, or rather on the pommel, is, is quite nice. The detailing is good. Now, it's my understanding that this is likely a cast piece, and as it's a cast piece, I find the edges and, and the detailing on it uh, reasonably crisp. There's not a lot of engraving or things that can get muddled in the casting. It's pretty straightforward with the exception of the three little inlets in the, in the front-facing side of the, the blade, but Nevertheless, it's all clean, crisp, well done. I will admit that it might be a little bit difficult to clean up, and in these small little crevices on a steel that's capable of rusting, this is one of the more worrisome parts on the blade that I'm, I'm concerned may degrade over time or be difficult to clean and maintain. Now, as I say that, it may be beneficial for me to demonstrate. You can see that this tapers down to a pretty small little ledge, and I would expect that these facets may cause discomfort. They don't, though. The blade is currently in oil, and whether I'm gripping it with my hand or if I just hold the whole pommel and hold it this way or this, in any case, it's actually a very comfortable user experience to hang on to. It doesn't bite in, and all it does is provide traction. Even if the blade is torqued, you know, skin isn't coming off my hand and there's no no significant discomfort. Now let's look at the grip of the blade. What I have is, if I compare the grip, there's a large spiral stack. I don't know exactly how this is made either, but the grip itself has more texture to it than your typical Albion. For comparison's sake, here's my Albion Mercenary, and you can just see the difference between the two grips. There's a much larger kind of ribbed sections on here than on the the mercenary blade and i would think that the mercenary is a little bit more common in terms of the grips that seem to be offered on albion blades comfort wise the grip is extremely easy to grab now uh, these large ridges give me traction on the blade it's very easy for me to find edge alignment it's in an elliptical shape which transfers more toward a, a, a sphere or a circle down towards the pommel but up at the top here it's very easy for me to index the blade and find where the edge alignment is and uh, on top of that, it's easy to grip barehanded, or again, like if I put a leather glove on or something like that, uh, it also helps me find traction on the blade. In either case, it's actually very comfortable to grip. Now, if I hold it really, really, really tight, you can see that it kind of bites in. Maybe you can see the, the, the pattern on my hand here. Just from holding it really tight, you can see that it, it puts a little indentation. That said, as I move it around, I don't feel discomfort. It doesn't feel like it's tearing into my hand, but it certainly uh, lets me get a lot of traction and pressure on the blade or on the handle. 
What I do find a little bit maybe odd is that there's no riser. I don't know if there should or shouldn't be. Again, this is supposed to be a recreation of a historic piece and I'm going to trust that that's what it is. But the blade honestly looks a little barren without a riser. If I look at the Albion Mercenary here, the central riser in the, in the middle of the grip, I, maybe it's just aesthetics, but I think it looks pretty and uh, it seems to be missing a characteristic like that. That's completely subjective though and I have no real historic reason or honestly, as a not student of martial arts, I don't really know what those do. I have absolutely no problem using the grip from a practical sense. It's merely an aesthetic thing that makes me think it, it just looks a little bit off. And maybe, well I don't really know why that is. Maybe it's because that's how I think swords should look. or. I watch too many movies, or maybe because I've seen too many Albion swords that have that, or modern European made medieval recreations of swords, but it still looks a little bit off. If you have any thoughts, throw it in the commentary below, though admittedly I have to note that uh, I don't really know what I'm talking about there. I just think it'd probably look cooler with one. In fact, as I compare it to the Earl, or the other Albion blade that has a similar blade profile of Type 18B. Uh, the grip on that one looks, I don't know, aesthetically just a little bit more zazzy. And I love zazz, so I guess that's why. The cross guard is an S-shaped cross guard, and it's actually not as simple as it necessarily appears. There are some swells where it tapers down to a smaller bit and f kind of bolsters out or, or expands out. Uh, they're also octagonal in shape, and it, it's actually a very pleasant, it's simple in appearance, but it actually is a little bit more complex in terms of its geometry than, than just a basic S-shaped guard. There's a little bit that more go, that goes into it than, than just being an S-shape, and I appreciate that. Now, it'd be nice to see some detailing, engraving, something else that would make this furniture more worthy of $4,000 in my opinion. It is simple, but I have to appreciate kind of the geometric change in shapes, and in its simplicity, it, it has some beauty in my opinion. Uh, now, in terms of an S-shaped guard, I don't really know pragmatically if it's better or worse. Here we have an S-shaped guard, here we don't. And I can see that if a blade were coming down, I would be able to catch it before it ran into my hand. So I'd imagine that it is, you know, without causing too much additional uh, wear, I could certainly see being able to put the S-shaped guard on my belt. It's not that much wider. Uh, it must offer some additional protection. So I have to, I have to think that this is probably a very practical thing to have to, to not get your knuckles whacked. The other thing that I think is worth noting is the gapping along the blade. So you can compare this mercenary, which is a reasonably good example, to this. And I think this has, you know, it might look very small in the camera, but again at $4,000 versus say $900, uh, this should be perfect. I don't think I should see this kind of swelled gap in between here. Now it does follow the curvature or the, the kind of hollow ground profile on the blade, but you can see that this one is just tighter. Um, now, I have to admit, again, this is a second-hand piece, and from my understanding, it has been rehilted. The, the hilt has been taken off, reassembled, and put back on to be secure. So maybe that has something to do with it, though um, I don't know. I don't know for sure. This leather flap obscures a lot of the photos that I'm able to see online, and in my current example, while it is better than most, it's still not perfect. The next thing I'll take a look at is the Ricasso. Now, the Ricasso aesthetically is really pretty, and one of the things that separates it from the other Type 18B, the, the Earl that I mentioned earlier. The Ricasso is, is honestly just kind of cool looking, and I have to admit that aesthetically it provides a, a um, not an overdone, but a really, I don't know, personally I find it very appealing looking. Uh, I have to admit, I, I like it. What function it serves, I have absolutely no idea. But at the same time, I do admit that it reminds me of just some general cool badassness. I can't imagine that it necessarily interferes with operation of the sword, though I admittedly don't know. I just think aesthetically it has a, a sense of appeal that that I, I thought, frankly, was stupid when I saw it the first time. But in person, uh, it really kind of grows on me, and I have to admit I, I've, I've grown rather fond of it. The other bit that's worth noting about the Ricasso is this blade has a pretty significant distal taper along it, and at the Ricasso it is uh, really pretty to just admire the, the symmetry and also how thick it is at the base, this hollow ground section, and how thin it tapers out to. That really begins as I examine the Ricasso. This piece of steel here appears very large in hand, and then as I go out to the tip, well it's still quite thick. It's, the, the taper on it is very gradual and very clean. 
and I, I begin to admire the Rocasso section even more because it's much wider at the Rocasso at the central ridge than, well, than on most swords that I see. Now, if I examine the blade itself, uh, I think in the photos, I don't really see how daunting and big this sword is. It's really quite a significant sword. As I compare it to the Albion Mercenary, which is another relatively significant sword, you can see that the handle is, is wider and larger. Uh, you can see the guard and how wide it is at the base here is, is much more profound. Uh, the Mercenary, which has a pretty wide, uh, pretty wide blade, you can see maybe that it's a... Uh, it's a pretty pretty substantial blade, and then in terms of length, um, the blade is is longer. I'm not doing a very good job of showing that to my camera though, but it is a, a very substantial blade. But in terms of its general shape, supposedly Albion classifies this as a Type 18B. They would know better than I would. I look at the photos, and it seems to fall somewhere between an 18B and an 18C. But then again, I don't really know the ins and outs of the, the geometry there. Overall, it's a, it's a very wide, uh, substantial blade. It's a hollow ground blade with a large central, uh, central ridge, central, large central ridge section. Uh, it has a nice gradual distal taper and it comes to a reasonably fine point, but not quite as fine as the mercenary that I have to compare it to, which is subsequently a completely different blade. So it's not really much of one of anything to compare to. The blade itself is also very rigid. So if I take my hand and bend, I mean, this is, this is a very stern feeling blade and I don't doubt that it would be easy to half sword. Um, I feel like I could, I could really get some point control here. I don't know exactly how this is meant to move. I know you use it quite a bit differently than the swordsmanship styles that I study, but I do feel like there's, there's really, a lot of a lot of stuff that could happen here and this this tool is extremely extremely rigid it does not have the same type of flex that many of the other swords I've had do especially this is relatively thin but this is extremely thick and while it it's a hollow ground blade I mean it's just one of the more rigid swords that I've ever felt one of the things I can also note is that it's not terribly sharp so if I take this and try to do any cutting with it It's just not, not an extremely sharp blade. Now this has come back from Albion and is sharp. Uh, in the shipping container, there's a central section that kind of holds it right about here, but I'm, I'm able to kind of touch the edge and really not fear for cutting myself really easily. Now it is serviceably sharp, but not, not as sharp as many of the other swords I've had. And I don't know, honestly, if that's supposed to be expected. This is supposed to be emulating a Type 18B sword. Uh, from my understanding, there's some sort of armored combat that might go in that, and maybe this is supposed to apply shock. Maybe it's supposed to transfer force into armor. Maybe it's supposed to do something like that rather than be just a really devastating cutter. So from that aspect, I don't know how well it should or shouldn't cut the Tommy mats. I don't know how well uh, it should be sharpened. I don't know if I should be able to do this. If half sorting is really what it's made to do, uh, and maybe it's it's supposed to be emulating the sharpness of a historic blade. Maybe this really hits the mark, but to me, it seems a little bit on the dull side. Now, as I compare the advertised measurements of the blade to what this blade has, I notice basically that the blade length is about an eighth of an inch off. And if the blade was resharpened or reprofiled in any way, that may account for the difference. Again, being a secondhand blade. Though that amount of variation is perfectly within expectation. Even though these are supposed to be milled out on a CNC machine, there's an amount of hand finishing that happens. And sanding off an eighth of an inch is certainly within reason. I would consider this one of the more accurate blades. But then again, it's supposed to be. It's supposed to represent as close to an exact rep reproduction of a historic piece as possible. So you would expect that this blade would be a little bit more on the nuts in terms of other blades that may vary a little bit more. The other thing that I'll note is that the advertised center of balance and center of percussion are also pretty much right on the nuts. Again, I think that this blade is supposed to emulate very accurately the dynamic properties of a historic blade as well. And so you'd expect that those, those points to be a little bit better observed than perhaps in other blades where there's more artistic liberty. There's really not any artistic liberty here, or at least there's much less than there is 
on a, on a different on a different blade that's designed to to be something similar or well basically I expect for that amount of money for it to be as accurate to the numbers as is possible and from the length that they provided being an eighth of an inch off perfectly acceptable but the dynamic properties being as close basically being spot on what I measured and what was advertised were pretty much the exact same thing and I have to give some props there. That might be a first for me on any sword I've ever reviewed ever. Certainly the weight is measured at four pounds. I measure the weight at four pounds. So again, they're, they're pretty accurate in terms of what goes into it. And it's really difficult to get a blade to measure out the exact way it's supposed to. There's a lot of complex angles and things going on here. It would be extremely easy to mess up a hollow grind and make the taper go off just marginally that would add an extra ounce. Uh, so getting it to exactly what's supposed to happen is uh, actually pretty impressive. So tip of my hat to you there, Albion. Now one thing that I find a little bit odd is I plug this into the Sword Dynamics computer. This sword was relatively meticulously uh, measured and historically, I don't know, researched by Peter Johnson. Peter Johnson, if you're unfamiliar with him, I have no idea why. Uh, chances are you are if you watch this channel, but Peter Johnson is a a uh, pretty well-recognized swordsmith in his own right, sword designer, researcher, author. In fact, he wrote a book about this particular sword, and I would have gone out and bought it, but one, I think it's only available in a non-English version, and two, I think it was limited to 500 copies, and they sold out some time ago. So uh, there are little excerpts and things like that that I'm able to find from it online, but I have no copy of the book that he wrote about this blade, which may have provided some more context for me to, to provide to you in this review, but alas, you'll have to ask him. That said, you can't ask him. Peter Johnson has taken time for me to answer random inane questions being some stranger on the internet rather than Matthew Jensen's sword guy. He's an extremely humble, honest, very nice uh, individual and I, I, every interaction I've had with him has been quite positive. Nevertheless, Peter Johnson and Vincent Lavachier, if I'm saying their names correctly, uh, dealt with creating an online tool to explain sword dynamics. I've included the chart here, and what you can see is that the measurements I'm able to take seem to be a little bit off of what is hypothetically uh, supposed to be, or theoretic values that are supposed to go in there. And I have to imagine that the, the center percussion, the point of balance, all of those seem to be on, but the rotational nodes seem to be off. And I don't really have a great explanation as to why that is. I've tried measuring it, but maybe I'm doing my measuring completely wrong. Anyway, these are the sword dynamic calculations that I got, and hopefully they help you in terms of getting an understanding of how this sword feels in the hand. What I can say about its general feeling is that it feels, uh, frankly, fantastic. The general dynamics of the sword in the hand, even though this is a very large, imposing blade, it actually feels extremely light. It feels lighter than my mercenary in the hand, and at four pounds, this is a substantial sword. Four pounds is on the upper end. As a Japanese sword guy, that's about as, as big as a sword gets uh, in terms of being still a katana. This is a long sword, or maybe that's not even the right classification for it, but uh, the, the sword itself is heavy. At four pounds, it is heavy, but no matter really where I hold it on the handle, it actually feels less than four pounds, and I don't have a great explanation for that. It might be the low center of balance that gives it a sense of, of, of lightness and tip control. I don't know. But the other thing I noted uh, in terms of handling is that it's just it's very easy for a sword of this size to have point control. If I compare it to other swords that I've had in the four pound category, they usually feel very tip heavy. They feel cumbersome. They feel like it's gonna be quite an effort to get the sword to move where you want it to move. And this doesn't, it feels light and agile and lively. And um, and really it's, it's kind of a joy to handle. One of the best experiences I've had with this sword has just been actually handling it and moving it around. It's provided really a lot of insights and made me ask a lot of questions about why a sword feels the way it does because this by any right should not feel as good as it does in my hand as good as it feels in my hand it cuts for shit and this is something that i, I have to give you with a grain of salt one i am not a historic european martial arts student i do study japanese sword arts i study sword arts of, of filipino martial arts and japanese sword arts uh, but that doesn't mean I know what I'm doing when it comes to a long sword or European style sword. Maybe there's some differences. I'm using Japanese style sword cutting techniques and you've seen me cut in some other videos. Uh, but the, the point is that I had really terrible luck 
cutting with the sword. And I think that has a lot to do, frankly, with the sharpness of the blade. It's not significantly sharpened. Uh, now, it's there are some interesting things that happen in terms of using the sword that I can observe. So one is, I really had to provide a lot of oomph to get it to move through a tatami mat. Uh, as I was cutting, it just, you know, I had real shit luck. It whacked into the tatami mats and really kind of smashed them rather than cut them. Uh, by comparison, I also cut with an Angus trim longsword of a completely different typology. Uh, but just to compare, so you see me using a different sword, using the same targets on the same day, with the same cutting techniques, with the same numbskull behind the sword, and you just see some of the difference in cutting profile. So you can't say all of it's just me. You get to see my faults on two different types of swords uh, as a comparison. And really I had a lot of d better luck cutting with the Angus Trim sword. It was a 1555, a diamond cross-section sword, a large, a large sword as well. And this one just didn't didn't cut very well, but there were two things that I could say uh, I noted during the process of using the sword. One is, in terms of getting my point on target, using a different long sword, it was a lot harder for me at a distance to put the point in the tatami mat, which is uh, not necessarily a small area, but it was hard for me to hit. I'm not I'm not that dexterous with a long sword or just generally thrusting. Most of the martial arts I study are are slashing, cutting methods rather than stabbing. So. Uh, when I practiced actually getting the point in the tatami mat, um, it was easier for me to do this. It feels like my arm is connected to the point of this blade. So that's one. Two, I felt way less shock in my hand with this. Now, bear in mind that I am hitting this uh, into the tatami mat and it's not cutting. And so as that's happening, the force should be traveling down and reverberating in my hands. I should be, th this, th the force has to transfer somewhere. It's not cutting through the mat. And so, you know, I should be absorbing a lot more shock in my hand, but I don't really feel it. That's a really interesting dynamic is as I'm clubbing this sword into a tatami mat and I'm absorbing that force and it's shooting the tatami mat off my stand and whacking it into somewhere off frame, uh, I don't really feel that verberation in my hand. But when I cut with the Angus Trim Longsword, as I even cut through it, I feel more reverberation in my hand moving through a target, which means I probably shouldn't be absorbing the same amount of force. I don't know, my physics is rusty. But the point is, I think if I whack into an object with a baseball bat type thing, I'm probably going to absorb more force. If I cut through something, I should be absorbing less force. If I'm off on that, just in terms of my, my thinking process, uh, throw that in the commentary below. But I, I will say that the interesting bit is, I did not feel a lot of vibration in my hand. Maybe it's because of the rigid structure, maybe it's from some other physical attribute that I'm unaware of, but in any case, it was a very comfortable thing to smash things with. Now, I'm going to shift into a different part of the review, and that is comparing this sword to its historic counterpart. Now, I'm not going to include a lot of history about this Fonte sword, where it was found, the history behind it. I'm going to include some links for those things, but frankly, I'm not really a student of history and I, I couldn't add a whole lot to it. So uh, frankly, I'm not going to try. I'll include some links below. Follow them if you're interested from a historical context. I'd imagine if you're looking at buying this sword, you are, and I wish I could provide you some historical reference to say this, that, or the other, but really I think I would be doing you a disservice by even attempting it. I'm not a student of history. It's not my passion, and so I'm not going to pretend it is. That said, that is an important part of this sword and I won't deny that. I think if you are interested in it, you should try and do some research, and if that story sings to you, if there's something historically that you find passion and interest in, that may be a large factor in whether you choose to buy this sword. Just know that I'm not going to cover a whole lot of it in this review. What I am going to do, though, is shift the review over to the section where I compare it to its historic counterpart. I was able to find some images online, and I will include a link in the description below to where I found these images, uh, but they appear to be images of the Svante sword the historic original. And fortunately, I live in an age where I have access to high resolution photography on the internet and I can compare mine to another version that I found online. And I think the comparison will be a little bit interesting. I can also share some of the historic little factoids that I found interesting about the recreation. And anyway, we'll get on with it. So the pommel itself. What I'm able to see with the pommel itself is that I don't know if a peen block existed. I don't see the same indications as the peen block I see on here, so I don't know if that's an artistic interpretation or not. But in any case, the general shape of the pommel seems 
pretty consistent. Also, the three little inlets or sections on the pommel, what I heard is that they may have included golden statues or statues of little precious metals, which frankly I think would be really cool looking. Now, this is a recreation of a historic sword and there was no indication from some sort of scientific scanning or logic used uh, to indicate that this sword had these golden statues or silver statues or something like that inside those little inlets. But there are other examples of historic swords that do have little statues and cool bits of something inside these little recesses. Initially, I admittedly thought it might be to reduce weight or something like that, and I wondered why there were only three of them on the front facing, but if it was for his, an aesthetic reason to include some sort of golden, cool-looking something, I can kind of understand the need to bedazzle. So. Anyway, I thought it was interesting to note why it might have been used, but that there was no indication that there were any type of precious metals or statues held in here. From the historic example, it's almost impossible to tell based on the amount of corrosion that's in there, though some silver and gold obviously may not corrode as, as much as iron, or maybe they were scooped out, who, who really knows. And anyway, at any rate, there was no indication that there were some sort of precious metals or other statues inside this one. Now, as I look at the grip, it's really difficult to say what the grip originally looked like. I think the kind of differentiation that they took in comparison to other Albions was reasonable. It looks like there's a, a larger cord around here. But in the central section, it looks like there may have been a riser. I don't know, maybe. Uh, it's tough for me to say. I have no idea what the grip originally looked like. And you can see here that in the central section, it looks like it has degraded more than other areas. Maybe that's because there was an iron riser, but admittedly, that's just wishful thinking on my part. I have no uh, anthropologic or archaeological or really even basic knowledge of what might have been there, but I just think there should be a riser. Anyway, uh, you can see, comparatively speaking, the grip looks very similar. I admire how the tapering and just general dimensions seem to be very similar to the, to the original grip. The cross guard seems to be very similar. Again, this one looks bent a little bit. I don't know why it would be bent. Maybe there's actually a functional reason where it would be at a slant versus completely horizontal. It might have happened because reasons. I, you know, honestly, anything is speculation on my part. It could be uh, degradation over time. It could be uh, a practical functional reason. It could be just because. Uh, bad eyesight. I don't know, but in any rate, the S-shaped guard and the proportions seem relatively similar, with the exception that uh, it looks a little off kilter, on the original anyway. The Ricasso section. So I, I found interesting that as I was reading some of the documentation about the sword, that the reason for the Ricasso section was a little bit up in the air. It might have been to save weight. It might have been to change the dynamic properties. It might be just because it looks really cool. It might be because it was damaged and to make it look aesthetically more pleasing to remove some of the damages. Why it exists is something I guess maybe lost to time or maybe you have an idea of why said thing existed. At any rate, uh, the, the literature I was able to find didn't necessarily hammer down the sense that Rocasso looks this way for this reason. Uh, a lot of it was, you know, that it could have been for a reason or it could have been just because it looks neat. And, and frankly, in either case, I'm happy with it because I, I do agree that it looks neat enough to just do because, because of that. The dynamic properties of the sword are something I don't know how you necessarily quantify from an image or by holding a, a rusty sword that you can't necessarily swing around, you know, in, in a museum. Uh, but I do have to take take on some faith that Peter Johnson, who's, again, as I mentioned, a pretty respected individual in the, in the community of researchers and swordsmiths, that uh, a swordsmith holding on to a sword in a museum and measuring it and understanding the dynamic properties, having made these objects himself, I have to think that he's a pretty good candidate to hold a sword and say, I can recreate how this sword originally felt. Now, I have to take that on some faith, because one, I don't understand the science, even if it were explained to me of how one would do that, but I trust that, frankly, he does, um, or at least he can get as, as close to it as is as anyone else would, or closer than I would be able to. So there is a, a little bit of faith that in terms of the dynamic properties, they're being respected, uh, having, I'm never gonna get the chance to really hold the original and move it around, especially in comparing them. Uh, but I, I do have some faith that somebody who, who has, did, and put every effort into making it feel similar. So this brings us to the end of the review and the rambling, and in this section I usually like to give whether I think it's worth it or not. So from my personal stakes, you know, honestly, no. Me personally, no. And that's because I can get two Albion, Albion Earls, or 
you know, maybe three different Elbian profile blades of a very similar build and construction quality for about the same amount of money as one of the Elbian Sfantes. And the fact that it's a found piece in a museum is of less interest to me than having different examples of similar historic period blades and maybe a, a few other blades uh, throughout different periods in history. I would rather have three Albions or two Albions than, than one, uh, knowing that I could have a Type 18B and something else, or maybe two something else's, is pretty cool, especially that Sovereign, because I've been lusting after that for a long time. The point is that this is a really expensive piece, and to me, I would, it's not, it's not the, the, the historical factors really aren't important to me. That is completely lost on me. I would rather have swords that I could have fun with in my backyard that might help me study historic European martial arts if I ever decide to go down that route. And even though this one is really interesting and it's a fantastically built, wonderfully uh, interesting, it has a great story behind it, those, those things, frankly, don't make it worth the money to me. Especially as I compare other swords that are similar, of similar build quality. It'd be one thing if they were the only sword that had something like this, but given that Albion offers something at least vaguely similar for much less money, I would probably put my money there, having never held that sword. Or maybe I have held it, I don't remember. The point is, no. For me personally, no. But I have to acknowledge that one, if you're a student of history or a collector that prefers things that have more historical ties than, than just a sword that's designed to resemble something that may have existed in the past, then this has a lot of diligence and effort put behind it that I can't say is a ripoff either. Uh, Peter Johnson spent some time uh, basically doing research and measuring the original and trying to as accurately as possible recreate that so you could hold a kind of a living version of history in your hand without having to travel to a museum and get permission from a curator. So from that aspect I have to acknowledge that it is really uh, a really powerful thing and if that is an aspect of collecting or swordsmanship or sword buying or this sword in particular that interests you then yeah it's just not personally my thing. So. Uh, I care less about that, but if you did, then I could see why this would be a very appealing sword for you to purchase. Nothing about it inherently is bad or makes me think it's not worth it. I don't doubt that there's a lot of hours logged in researching, a lot of hours logged in how to recreate it as accurately as possible. Again, I noted how really close the, the advertised measurements and dynamic properties Albion is. To put that level of quality control into it, to put, put that level of research into it, there's a lot of stuff that happens on the back end before you ever hold the sword, and that costs money. So I, I really can't balk at the $4,000 price tag, but I do have to acknowledge that it's really targeting a specific set of, of people interested in swords, and I just don't happen to be one of those people that finds a, a whole lot of value in that specific thing. From a collector standpoint as well, it's my understanding that this is a limited run, though I have to acknowledge that many Albions right now, in terms of August 2017, secondhand are selling very close to their original MSRP, which is pretty rare in the realm of sword selling. A lot of times mass production swords, even if they are of a limited quantity, don't sell for anywhere near what they sell for new, even if they're discontinued. Uh, most Albions are selling for, again, pretty close to their original MSRP, sometimes even a little bit over. Right now, there's a limit on the supply demand, but I was able to buy this one for much less than the original advertised price. I'm quite happy with it for what I paid for it, but it was not sold to me for $4,000. Again, it's secondhand, it's been, you know, rehilted, it's been sent back to Albion for, for cleanup, but nevertheless, there's a lot of swords from Albion that are not in the original condition, selling for very close to the original condition. So I can't explain that, but I have to acknowledge from a collector standpoint, it seems like these have come up for less than the original sale. And I don't know if they will gain in value or not, but my guess would be probably not. Another thing that might actually be worth noting is that $4,000, what does $4,000 get you? $4,000, gets you a lot of different things and frankly in the European sword market right now there's a lot of things available for four thousand dollars from custom smiths. Now what remains to be seen is I do not know if you could have a smith make you something like this as accurately as this is supposed to represent the original for four thousand dollars and I have to keep in the back of my mind 
that that is really the intention of this particular blade. That said, you could probably have a Smith make you something similar for less than $4,000 and you would truly have a one of a kind historically something, I don't know how historic, but you could have at least a custom sword which is likely also very good. So in the end, is it worth it? Hopefully I've answered that question. Frankly, I just can't answer it for everyone. Uh, to me personally, no. To a person that's looking as an investment, I wouldn't advise it. But to somebody who's really interested in history and the historical factors surrounding this, if it's part of their heritage, their lineage, if they think it just looks really badass, nothing about it inherently says absolutely not. Though, if it were me, if it were my $4,000, I'd rather have three Albions, or at least two, than this one. Now, I've rambled on long enough, and I'm going to wrap it up here. What I'd like to finish with is just saying that this review was uh, actually really tough for me to wrap my head around. I, I hope that some of it has been at least useful to you if you were considering buying this sword. I do have high praise for it. I do think it's a good product, but uh, admittedly, whether it be my, my novice understanding of historic European swords, uh, this typology in general, or how to classify it as a historic object and how to wrap your head, or my head rather, around that, I struggled with this review a bit, and I have the feeling that I've left a good amount out. And so, if you have things to add about what you like, what you don't like, what you think I missed, what things should be noted, or other questions you might have that I can add to the, to the review, please let me know in the commentary below. Send me an email. In any case, just contact me. Let me know, but preferably in the comments so everyone can share in the conversation. I hope that this has been helpful. I hope you found it useful, and that's really all I have for you. Again, cheers, and thanks for watching. Why are you four thousand dollars? Testy test 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 tester ten. I'm fucking testing some stuff. You're here, and I really like being. Does it grant you lands and title? Will anyone suck my dick because I have it? And oh, nope 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 nope. $4,000. Can I ride you like a broom? I need more blood. $900. $4,000. $900. Wiener. Can I whack it? No, just kidding. I'm not going to do that. It's funny that I could have two of my first car or you. I could have two shitty cars. Why $4,000? That's so much fucking money. Do you print money? Do you grant wishes? Can I use you to make a delicious rotisserie chicken? Can I use you as a pepper shaker? Four grand.